Welcome to the second session of this conference. Uh, before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting today, the Namibu people, and pay my respect to their past, present, and emerging. Um, my name is Wen Ting Chen and uh, the moderator of this session. Uh, I'm currently a Grand Challenge Research Fellow working at the NU Grand Challenge Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific. And my research focuses on law and regulation facilitating the net zero transition. Uh, it's my great pleasure to work together with Tashia and colleagues in the last month to organize this conference. And um, I sincerely hope Kashi will have a quick recovery. Um, so we have had excellent speakers to set the scene this morning, uh, followed by lunch, and I believe a lot of uh, interesting in-person discussions during the lunch time. So the session in the morning reminds me about the theory put by um, Professor Neil Gunningham from the School of Regulation and Global Government at the ANU, um, Energy Trilemma. So there are conflicting objectives between energy equity, which is affordability of energy by consumers, energy security, and we have indeed had discussion this morning about organization of energy, as well as sustainability. So the theme of this session is perspectives from the EU states, EU and its member states. Uh, so we will get more in-depth discussion about how the energy trilemma has played out in the current context. Um, we are pleased to have invited four distinguished speakers today in this session. They will present um, responses from the EU in general as well as from two of its member states, Germany and Poland. And uh, the last speaker will also uh, talk about offshore wind power as a promising energy, energy source to achieve the long-term decarbonization. Um, our first speaker today uh, in this session is Scott Wyatt. He is advisor to the delegation of the EU to Australia. Mr. White is responsible for the environment, energy, and other priority areas at the delegation of the European Union to Australia. He has over 13 years experience providing advice to the EU Commission, to the European Commission, the European Union External Action Service, and successive EU ambassadors. Uh, prior to this, Mr. White worked in natural resource management policy and has held positions in the private sector. He holds a degree in commerce and the biological science. Our second speaker is Mr. Bertil Wenger. He is the director of the Polnert Adnauer Schnifton Regional Program Australia and the Pacific. He previously led the International Office of the Christian Democratic Union, CDU of Germany. Uh, prior to his role with the CDU, Ms. Wenger served as scientific advisor and head of office for a parliamentary state MP. Um, he is a legal and international public affairs expert with significant experience in defense, security, energy, and telecommunications. Our third speaker is uh, Mr. Jacob uh, Wilhelm. He's the head of Polish Investment and uh, Trade Agency in Australia and New Zealand. He has managed Australia and New Zealand office of the Polish Investment and Trade Agency, supporting the Polish exporters and investors to establish operations in the region. Before joining the agency, Jacob works on private sectors managing companies in mining, chemical, and real estate sectors in Poland, Australia, and the USA. He started in Poland, Denmark, and Taiwan. Our last speaker is Associate Professor uh, Louisa Hughes. He's at the Crawford School of Public Policy ANU. From 2018 to 2021, he serves as Associate Dean of the Research in the ANU's College of Asia Pacific. 
Dr. H Professor Hughes is a social scientist researching in the low carbon energy transition. He's particularly focused on public policies that help to create durable comparative advantage while responding to climate change. A key area of work of his is offshore wind power globally and in the Asia Pacific. Um, so we will also hear from him today. Um, so I think after the introduction, we will welcome Scott for our first presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can I just check, uh, can someone give me a wave at the back just to make sure that they can hear me? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd just like to start by offering my thoughts to the people of uh, Ukraine. In terms of this event, to extend my thanks to the Centre for European Studies, but also to give a shout out to the ANU for uh, all the expertise that resides here in terms of energy and climate policy. Uh, there are many folks here who are leaders in their field in terms of uh, climate science, uh, climate uh, and energy economics, engineering and the like. So I think the diplomatic community and the Canberrans in general are very lucky to have uh, such a centre of expertise uh, locally. So just to kick things off, I think it's worth, and we're a room of relative experts here, but I think it's always um, useful to reflect uh, on the importance of, of energy. So if you just think about it for a moment, we've got the heating, ventilation and, and cooling in this room. Um, I mean, if it was minus 15 outside, it would be uh, you know, more apparent, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it's keeping us comfortable now. If you are to think about the uh, energy that would have gone into the manufacturing of this carpet here uh, on the ground, or indeed if you were virtuous and, and uh, walked or rode your bike here to this conference, actually if you, if you think about the energy you would have metabolized while you were coming here and in terms of the food you consumed, well where did the fertilizer come from that grew that food, How, you know, the, the tractor that uh, made its way up and down plowing the field, all that kind of thing. So. I just want, wanted to sort of make the point that energy is absolutely indispensable for civilization. Ever since the first sort of cavemen were using, uh, cavemen, cavemen were using fire to keep themselves warm and, and, and uh, to heat them away. Okay, so uh, um, it was just mentioned a moment ago, but uh, if we pause for a moment to think about uh, what many people refer to as the energy trilemma. So what we're looking for in an energy system uh, we want uh, security, uh, we want affordability and sustainability. Uh, there are many tens of millions of people, uh, even in the EU, who are uh, under energy uh, poverty. Of course, sustainability, the big one there is climate change, but there are others. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so we're looking for safe, sustainable, affordable, uh, energy system. So the, these concepts are all very much interlinked. I'm not going to, to labor that point, but it will be apparent there. So uh, if you look at the slide here, this is uh, relates to the energy union strategy, um, which has been around since uh, 2015. And uh, the concepts uh, secure, sustainable and affordable energy are very much embedded into to the energy union as a concept. Okay, so this is quite an important slide. If you can't see it at the back, I'm going to speak to it. Um, as other colleagues, uh, other speakers today have mentioned, the EU spends approximately 1 billion euros a day on importing energy products. About 100 billion euros per annum has been flying to Russia to pay for energy imports from that country. That's slightly different to Frank's uh, figure, I think it was in US dollars, but um, you get the idea, it's an awful lot of money. Um, so there's a lot wrapped up in this. So looking at the slide, you can see to start with at the bottom there, um, we're looking at uh, hard coal. Uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh. So if we look at uh, hard coal, import dependency has risen from um, approximately 30% up to uh, around 70%. Um, if we look right at the top there, you can see a very, very high degree of uh, import dependency on crude and natural gas liquids, as NGOs, uh, it consistently in the 90s, and it's in fact trended up, upwards slightly. 
Now, the, the big one, uh, another speaker that spoke of the why this is a big one, is this natural gas there. You can see uh, hovering uh, around 50% for a few years um, and then uh, rising quite spectacularly up to 90% by 2019. So this time series runs from 1990 to 2019. And I have checked some more recent figures and certainly natural gas has not deviated much from that. It's still around uh, 90%. Of course, there's a lot happening right now, but you get the idea. Okay, so uh, this time series is slightly different. We're now going from 2010 to 2020, just to make you aware of that. But, um, this slide, uh, as you can see, looks at uh, energy production by fuel type. So uh, to speak to a couple of those, um, you can see on, on the positive side in terms of uh, uh, meeting greenhouse gas emission production goals and uh, addressing energy security issues, uh, that renewables have increased increased quite dramatically there so that's that's a um, that's a positive uh, nuclear energy has uh, diminished somewhat uh, i'm not going to speak to that because generally speaking nuclear is, is, is a member state competence there is eu level um, governance of uh, um, supply and safeguards and nuclear safety that kind of thing but it's up to member states uh, how they use or choose to use uh, whether they choose to use nuclear in the energy mix we can get from that if you like so that's that one so um solid fossil fuel so currently coal uh on the production side of things has again trended downwards quite markedly um and again the big one that you can see right at the bottom there is this natural gas has dropped off Spectacular. Okay, so uh, this slide here imports from Russia in gross available energy. So, this is all of the energy that's required to meet a country's needs, and the, the timestamp there is 2020. So, I must stress that things are evolving over time and have evolved over time. But part of the reason I put this slide here was just to illustrate to you that uh, there is a great deal of variation between the member states in terms of uh, um, uh, imports from Russia. And in this particular um, set of data, you can see uh, Lithuania um, at, at one extreme and, and Cyprus uh, right at the other. Um, and again, one has to be quite careful in interpreting statistics like this and to recognize uh, quite specifically what they're actually looking at. So as I said, this is uh, imports from Russia across all of the energy that's required to meet uh, a country's requirements. Okay, looking at, uh, looking at oil here for a moment, uh, I think my ambassador, Ambassador Polch, um, mentioned that uh, uh, the EU is considering sanctions for oil. Um, there's not yet agreement on that, but it's, it's under discussion. It's, it's a bit complicated for some member states, but nevertheless, it's under debate at the moment. So what you see here is EU production, trade and imports. And uh, clearly uh, the right-hand side uh, segment of the pie chart there, uh, a significant portion taken up by imports from Russia uh, and a very large portion, of course, uh, other trade with a small amount coming from domestic indigenous production and uh, stock changes. Similar situation for coal, a similar sort of graph. Uh, again, a much bigger proportion coming from domestic production. Of course, that varies hugely with members, between member states, but that's the, the picture for the EU overall. Um, of course, a lot from trade. So uh, just to make a mention that uh, the EU, in fact, imports typically about 10 to 15 percent of its coal requirements uh, uh, from Australia, which not everyone knows. Um, the other big players are the US, Colombia and South Africa. Now, uh, coal, um, there, has, there is actual agreement on sanctions uh, for coal, and that's playing out at the moment. Uh, I think there are some stipulations there whereby certain contractual arrangements can be, uh, can be met, but that's been phased in as we speak. Okay, so what we see here, uh, a share of natural gas imports um, within the EU. So again, as has been referred to by myself and other speakers, you can see Russia very much dominant, with the, make up the bottom part of these uh, um, the, the graphic illustrations there, with uh, Norway a significant supplier, <coughs> Algeria a big one there, 
uh, tax stamps to Transaviotic Pipeline, which is part of the uh, Southern Gas Corridor, bringing gas from uh, the Caspian. Um, and importantly, very importantly, in terms of today's discussion, you can see uh, LNG at the top there. So uh, LNG um, sort of varies from well below, let's say below 10% in this time series to uh, you know, around uh, just over the 20% mark. Um, <laughs> So first of all, what, what is LNG? Just in case there's anyone in America who doesn't know, it's, it's natural gas that's been cooled down to minus uh, 161 degrees. You can therefore fit an awful lot on it on, on, a, on an LNG carrier. And provided you've got gas regasification uh, re facilities at the other end, it's a uh, very flexible fuel source. You can, you can ship it from uh, you know, anywhere around the world <coughs> as long as you can get to you know, pay for it. Interestingly, as many in this room will be aware, Australia has in fact risen to be the world's uh, foremost LNG exporter. Um, well, that's as of last year. Uh, we expect that uh, the US and Qatar will soon surpass uh, Australia, but nonetheless, Australia is an extremely important supplier of this commodity. Um, so uh, I mentioned the on the last slide, the LNG statistics. Um, interestingly, as you can imagine, and I'm going to speak to this a little bit further on, but uh, uh, we are in fact seeing LNG import records being broken in the EU at the moment. So to give you some specific figures, uh, in April, so just uh, last month, we saw the, 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 the figure itself, it's not so important as the relative, I suppose, but the, we saw a 12.5 BCM billion cubic meters imported. Um, so to give you a comparison, I looked it up for the whole of Q3 2021, there was 17 BCM imported. So we were, the point is we're seeing some record LNG import uh, stats at the moment, not surprisingly. Um, so uh, I, I've tried to uh, highlight the effects very well with my own budget use for mouse, but uh, uh, you can see um, uh, the US is what I was trying to draw attention to there. Um, so uh, the US has become increasingly important as an LNG supplier to the EU. Just picking up on this, this stat is actually from the US government, all the others are from, <coughs> from the EU sources, of course. Um, so anyway, I just thought it interesting to put this one, one uh, here, it uh, tells a fascinating story. So around uh, 2006, uh, we saw a huge inflection point in terms of uh, US gas production. And that largely arose because of uh, what people deem the, the shale Revolution, so advances in hydraulic fracturing and uh, um, horizontal drilling. So, US gas production from shale gas took off spectacularly. Um, and uh, that, that had a flow on effect to uh, LNG exports. So, you can see exports, imports there, and bam, away it goes. Um, so, in, in the context of um, in the context of uh, the response to the Ukraine crisis, uh, the US has undertaken to work with the EU to supply an additional 15 BCM this year of LNG, ranging up to 50 BCM, and that's, that's working with international partners and there's an agreement between the President von der Leyen and, uh, and Biden. So to put it in perspective, when I'm talking about these BCM figures, the whole uh, gas consumption for the EU is around 400 BCM annually. Obviously, that varies a bit, but that gives you a sense. Okay, so uh, now looking uh, at electricity specifically, um, again, put that up, put this up here to partly illustrate to you the wide variation between member states. Uh, as you can see, the, the member states do vary widely in terms of how they currently derive their uh, electricity. Um, with uh, some member states, of course, fossil fuels still featuring quite prominently, whereas others, such as Sweden on the far right hand side, uh, very much dominated by um, uh, you know, nuclear and, uh, and renewables. Okay, so the EU has uh, or had, has had um, uh, climate and energy targets for 2020. Um, we call these the 2020 20 targets uh, because there was a uh, target for renewable energy and final energy consumption. There was a uh, target for uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction, which my uh, colleague, the ambassador, has mentioned as well achieved. And there was a target for energy efficiency. Uh, we've done very well on the renewables as well as the greenhouse gas reduction targets. Uh, so you can see here that the EU has in fact uh, achieved its, its uh, renewable energy and final energy consumption 
gold. So just to clarify, this is not electricity, this is final energy consumption. So it's, uh, there is a big difference. Some people use energy and electricity interchangeably, which is uh, very much um, uh, you know, not, not accurate. Um, the energy efficiency, 2020 energy efficiency target asked uh, colleagues at headquarters and uh, um, we were expecting a, a gap, but uh, with uh, COVID, um, uh, there was a decline in, in overall energy consumption, and so the uh, energy efficiency target was met, but uh, we weren't, we were going to fall short, so were it not for COVID, unfortunately, so there's more work required there. Okay, again, just to show here um, the uh, variations in terms of uh, um, electricity from uh, renewables, so you can see across the member states, Austria, Florida, um, Malta, Norway, and Iceland, about how member states are in um, so at, at the moment, uh, the EU derives about 37.5 of its electricity needs from renewable sources, which obviously has a bearing on uh, energy security issues. So here we see a um, breakdown of, of how the renewables are generated in the electricity sector. I'm talking here again, uh, dominated very much by uh, wind and hydro, We're expecting solar to, to gain some uh, traction there. Uh, just to pick another specific example, um, fresh from the Eurostat uh, website, uh, you can see a, a dramatic sort of increase in the uptake of zero emissions uh, vehicles. Uh, the EU's had long-standing CO2 standards for cars, and you can see this uh, ramping up quite significantly in terms of zero emissions vehicles. Okay, so the reason I put this up here is just to, to illustrate to you that Things were moving uh, in the context of, obviously, in the context of meeting uh, energy security of supply challenges prior to the invasion of Ukraine. And this is the Crook uh, regasification facility in Croatia that was uh, inaugurated last year um, and received EU money. EU, EU money. So uh, we have something called the Projects of Common Interests. Uh, whereby projects that meet certain criteria that go towards meeting the EU's collective objectives can receive uh, expedited approvals processes, this kind of thing. Um, and they can also receive EU funding on, in, under something called the Connecting Europe facility. And, and this facility got 124 million euros. There are many, many other, other examples I could give, and I think that includes electricity and connectors, but just to give you one example there. Okay, so this is uh, this slide speaks to uh, the package of policies that was announced uh, in mid last year that will underpin the EU's new emissions reduction target. So I think Ambassador Paul mentioned this, but the EU now has a, an emissions reduction target uh, of at least 55% by 2030 levels from 1990, which is all well and good, but those that aren't too familiar with the EU might say, well, they might be cynical and say, well, what does that mean? You know, put up a target. Uh, how do you achieve that? And at the moment, we have a big suite of policies that will under, underpin the current targets. But uh, this, is a, this is a slide just sort of presenting the very basics of uh, the package uh, set that was un unveiled to give effect to that uh, new ambitious target um, that's uh, um, outlined in our uh, in, in EU's collective NDC. So just to um, pick one column, for example, that does relate to uh, well, they all in some ways relate to energy security, but if you can see that on the top right hand side, uh, I put out that, that slide earlier in terms of uh, zero emissions vehicles. Um, so the proposals as they stand include, for example, ramping up those zero emissions uh, uh, vehicle standards to the point where for light vehicles that would in fact be mandatory by 2035, so phasing out, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, polluting vehicles, uh, light vehicles by 2035. Some member states have already got time. That would be a new one. Um, the, the second to last one on that column there, uh, there's, uh, there are specific, very specific targets uh, set out that should be legislation passed for um, sustainable fuels and, and aviation, which again uh, speaks very much to, to the issue of energy security as well as addressing climate change, similar for maritime fuels there. Okay, so I'm just going to end quickly. Um, I'm going to seem a little bit wooden here, perhaps, but uh, uh, some of this stuff is just, just playing out right now. So I'm, I'm very much acquainted myself with this. This is just some of the stuff's just come out in the last few days. 
So um, I'm going to go through some very recent developments very quickly. So uh, one, one important aspect of how the EU is responding to, to this challenge of energy security is in regards to gas storage. Obviously, gas storage is very important for cushioning against supplies. Um, in terms of EU gas consumption, as you would expect if you're looking from January to December, it's very much of a U shape like this, reflecting the seasons. Of course, we're coming into um, the Northern summer now. So we're, we're coming up to that period when, uh, when countries, companies need to refill their, their energy um, storage uh, facilities. So there is in fact a new EU proposal whereby uh, member states must ensure that underground gas storage is filled to 80% by 1 November this year, and then 90% in subsequent years. There are intermediate targets supporting this. And to provide some additional background, there are 160 storage facilities across 18 member states. So but while a very fresh update, just on Thursday, it was announced that the European Council and the Parliament had in fact reached political agreement on this gas storage um, proposal. So things are moving quickly. And uh, within that uh, proposal, uh, operators will have to report to national authorities and member states in turn will be required to report to the European Commission on a monthly basis. And I just to pick up on the comments quickly by the uh, Ukrainian ambassador, there will be um, uh, provisions in there to require third country owners of storage facilities to undergo a permitting process. So the EU is looking at addressing that very topic that the Ukrainian ambassador so rightly uh, mentioned. So now on, on something called Repower EU, just, just to, to wind up that my ambassador referred to, Repower EU is a blueprint to end imports of fossil fuel uh, derived products from Russia well before 2030. The basic elements of the plan were presented in March with the details released on Wednesday, uh, our time. So this uh, conference is very timely. So you can say that there are three basic pillars in, in our approach. Uh, one of them is to diversify supply. The other is to accelerate the green transition. And the third, to step up energy efficiency measures to use less of energy in the first place. 85% of Europeans believe the EU should reduce dependency on Russian oil and gas as soon as possible in support of the Ukraine. Repower EU proposes increasing the energy efficiency target from nine to 13% over and above the existing proposed increase under the Fit for 55 package that I mentioned earlier. Nine to 13% doesn't sound like a lot, I can explain it. It does mean a lot because we've actually um, uh, rejigged the, the reference scenario um, for those numbers. So if anyone's interested, I can explain that, but it's far more ambitious than it sounds. There's a newly created EU energy platform which will pull demand and create the possibility for joint purchases, including hydrogen. The platform will include the Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. The renewables target will rise from 40% under Fit for 55 to 45%, so again a massive increase. A new solar strategy aims to see a doubling of PV capacity to 2025 to reach, and to reach 600 gigawatts of capacity by 2030. Importantly, there will be a new obligation to install solar equipment on all new buildings above a certain size and on new residential buildings phased in from 2026 to 2029. So that's a mandatory measure if it, if it passes. The package foresees accelerated permitting through guidance to member states and under renewables legislation. A new biomethane action plan comes with financial incentives to increase production to 35 BCM through the common agricultural policy. There is a new EU external action, excuse me, external action plan, which comes sorry, which emphasizes uh, supply diversification, acceleration of the energy transition and building partnerships and promoting clean energy across the world. The new external energy policy foresees amongst other things, working with Canada, who has already been a joint statement, I've already mentioned the US, so I won't mention that again. Working to conclude new agreements with Israel and Egypt, aiming to restart dialogue with Algeria, increasing cooperation, with Azerbaijan, Nigeria, Senegal, Angola, and even Iran are also mentioned. 
Of course, Australia does get a uh, mention and, and very much in the context of Australia's potential when it comes to hydrogen, renewable hydrogen. And as my ambassador mentioned, uh, we are uh, uh, undertaking FTA negotiations at the moment, which form an important part of the, the bilateral relationship going forward. Finally, uh, with uh, Repower EU also foresees an additional 15 million tonnes of renewable hydrogen on top of the 5.6 million tonnes under Fit for 55. And this includes 10 million tonnes of imported hydrogen. So that gives you a sense of uh, some of the things that are playing out at the moment. And as I was talking to some colleagues earlier uh, on in the break, uh, uh, there's a lot happening, there's a lot changing day by day. Um, and some of the stuff has just come out in the last few days. So it's, uh, it's an interesting space. And uh, uh, you know, the work EU is working very hard to address these issues. Thank you. Let's welcome our second speaker. Sorry. Yeah. I'll go to you. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here uh, to you all. Um, climate protection and um, decarbonizing uh, a decarbonizing energy transition are uh, huge global challenges, and they can be characterized as an international public good uh, problem. And um, today, I would like to take a critical, I might say very critical, look at the German energy transition, the Energiewende, as we say, uh, and especially as I think its flaws um, in the technical setup and execution. Um, and please bear in mind um, by everything that I say that all of this has to be seen in the light of sort of the general German decision that the pillars of this energy transaction, uh, transition are getting out of nuclear power, um, getting out of the use of coal and substitute all of this um, by <laughs> renewable energy and increased uh, gas deliveries and um, the war in Ukraine has put us in that regard in between um, sort of a rock and a hard place. Um, the climate policy of Germany is um, ambitious and yet it's limited, uh, expensive and inefficient and uh, does not really contribute to the desired reduction of the CO2 emissions. Why is that uh, so? And why are we in Germany subject to sort of an illusion in our climate policy? And the reasons for that, I think, are multifold. Uh, one, um, politics very rarely has a tendency to concede that it is wrong. Um, in Germany, politics um, in energy and climate are uh, getting tangled, <clears throat> excuse me, in sort of distributional conflicts with renewable energy lobby groups. And politics orchestrates, I say, very often, just pretended um, efforts in public. Um, furthermore, politics, politicians tend to go more in sort of dirigistic ways than to market-based um, uh, policy instruments. And uh, they have a tendency to sort of ease the urge towards a distribution of interventions in the market. So for a long time, Germany saw itself as a pioneer uh, in climate policy. However, we have to concede the balance sheet is rather sobering. Most of the climate policy goals are not being achieved uh, and the societal costs of environmental policies are very high. Uh, the ineffectiveness and inefficiency uh, of this climate policy requires it, in my view, a fundamental change in strategy, uh, which can only be achieved by a uniform CO price, CO2 price for all sectors. Um, and I'm saying this in a clear view that protecting the climate is a major challenge, um, even in the current times where COVID um, is still dominating. Uh, it's a global phenomenon uh, that affects everyone worldwide and to which all countries, all countries should make a contribution. So um, as we all know, in terms of avoidance strategy, climate protection is the production of anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, climate protection is a global public good, but as we all know, that suffers from a sort of free rider problem, meaning a single country that lowers its greenhouse emissions, uh, bears the cost that result from this, 
and all countries in the world benefit from the reduction, even if they themselves do not contribute to it, to, to it itself. So um, as a result, um, each country has little incentive to invest in climate protection itself um, uh, if the benefits are distributed worldwide. So basically what we are facing are national climate policies measures that cause domestic welfare losses and contribute only slightly to the global avoidance of greenhouse gases. Climate policy is an international common problem, uh, not an information problem or a perception problem. Well, maybe in some countries there is a perception problem. Um, the problem of common good can therefore only be solved with voluntary mutual measures uh, between the sovereign states. And the um, expert bodies that we have in Germany, for example, the German Council of Economic Experts, they urgently demand a global coordination um, that should form an essential element of German climate policy and contribute to uniform CO2 pricing worldwide. Um, however, uh, this is exactly the opposite uh, of what the 2015 uh, Paris Climate Protection Accord stands for with its rather uncoordinated, non-binding national CO2 uh, reduction commitments. We have 197 countries signing up to this, but all with national measures. Um, let me remind you that um, climacy policy in Germany is shaped by the so-called Erneuerbare Energiegesetz, the Renewable Energy Sources Act. And this is um, by views of the expert bodies that I've just uh, cited, um, very fragmented, uh, it's expensive and inefficient. It makes not enough contribution to the reduction of greenhouse gases. Um, and our further decision in Germany to phase out coal, as I indicated, and the so-called climate package 2030 um, are basically further steps um, in a German climate policy that continue this line. Um, but let's take a close look. Why um, am I saying that this is unsatisfactorily inefficient, expensive and ineffective? Why are we in Germany subject to an illusion of reality when it comes to climate policy um, in that regard? And why are we not possible to orchestrate sort of a fresh start as is indicated and recommended by a lot of energy experts in Germany? There are many reasons for this. Um, one, I indicated already, politicians do not necessarily seem sufficiently willing or are unable to learn and can only adequately admit wrong decisions. Um, politics gets too tangled up, as I said, in distribution struggles. And politics in Germany these days tend to use planned economy more than market economy. Um, yeah, as I said, the uh, Renewable Energy Act, which provides for the expansion of renewable uh, energies, and in particular, uh, the promotion of uh, regenerative uh, uh, um, powers, um, sort of regulates that you have a guaranteed um, fixed feed-in tariff, you have an obligation to connect renewable energy systems um, and priority uh, feed-ins for electricity from renewable energies. And the core element is a... Um, sort of technology specific allocation financed uh, promotion of renewable energies over a guaranteed period of 20 years. And this ever since the introduction of the idea in the year uh, 2000 has basically led to sort of historically grown proliferations of different taxes, levies and surcharges on various forms of, of energy consumption um, and that sort of stands in the way of an effective and cost-efficient uh, climate policy. Um, it kind of distorts the investment decisions of households and companies and leads to high additional costs and unfortunately to not enough success in reducing CO2 emissions. Um, and very early on in this process, uh, already in 2004, uh, the German Scientific Advisory Board has basically pointed out that direct support for renewable energies um, would not contribute significantly to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the experts were also wondering of how to guarantee the security of supply for Germany um, as an industrial uh, location uh, for the future and also with regard to uh, sufficient electricity storage capacities. Um, interestingly enough, this has found um, 
this logic has found little entrance into the political discourse and into the decisions of the politically responsible. Um, and neither has, for that matter, the sobering report of German climate policy, where the CO2 emissions remained almost unchanged over the past, say, 10 to 12 years. Um, and the high costs and inefficiencies have hardly led to the insight of those responsible in politics and not to a fundamental reversal in climate policy. On the contrary, um, larger parts of politics, of course, and the population uh, still basically talk about the utmost success of this transition and sort of continue to glorify the climate and energy mismanagement of the energy transition. Now, um, it's, um, it's known that politicians basically strive to take as clear a political stance as possible in certain policy areas in order to differentiate themselves from, from contenders. Um, and with that basically being that main say, it's not easy for scientists or stakeholders uh, to change these political and content related positions with sort of knowledge based clarifications uh, in the matter. So, um, especially with regard to politics, and I've seen this in the CDU, for example, my party, that changes in the externally announced political positioning of members of parliament, they're either not possible or only marginal or respectively over a long period of time. Um, and also politicians, of course, have to take care of what their party says and party policies are very slow to um, evolve only step by step and by party Congress decisions in Germany um, uh, for, for the most part. <clears throat> and all of this has basically led to the Renewable Energy Sources Act bringing about an extensive yet small scale regulatory density in the energy sector, um, which was over the last 20 years able to defend itself against fundamental reform measurements and the reduction of privileges. Um, and we have a lot of various assertive interest groups who are largely successfully trying to basically obtain the Renewable Energies Act revenues, other financial privileges, political decision makers are keen to grant these. Um, and the large overall group of um, electricity consumers, um, which is very difficult to organize, they basically bear the total costs. Um, we have strong players in this regard. We have the uh, renewable energy associations. We have the companies in the energy industry. We also have um, the federal states. Germany is composed of uh, 16 federal states, um, which are naturally in favor of their location <laughs> managers. Um, in Germany, that would be in a nutshell, wind in the north, sun in the south, and the big agrarian states can contribute bioenergy. There is, of course, a lot of climate uh, protection bureaucracy with the Federal Environment Agency pursuing its own policy. Um, so um, it, all of this is a sign of the enormous power of the renewable energy lobby groups that despite early criticism has little, little has changed sort of in the basic structure of this fragmented, inefficient and also socially unbalanced funding. And the more the economic importance of this the sector increases and the larger the uh, proportions of the population that operates renewable energy systems itself is, the less willing and able are politicians um, to basically act in the future against their interests and carry out the necessary realignment of the uh, energy vendor as demanded by the German Council of Economic Experts. So in conclusion, um, effective climate protection uh, requires a drastic reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions, and thus a comprehensive um, transformation of the energy supply systems and a fundamental restructuring of the entire economy and consumption with regard to greenhouse gas neutrality. Um, and since these restructuring processes are highly cost intensive, um, cost efficiency of climate policy measures is of central importance. <laughs> Um, however, this can best be brought about by market economy coordination, uh, which uses sort of decentralized price signals to ensure that climate pollution is avoided where the costs of avoidance are the lowest. 
The other side of the coin, however, is that this is not at all uh, the logic of politicians to sort of outsource public important issues to the economic area, basically, and to give the prices that are formed um, to be formed by the market, uh, the market give the market a chance so to uh, to do that. Um, and for you know, much much more is political logic in Germany, or has been sort of geared towards a direct, short term, and sort of attributable interventions by politicians that they can, in the end, merit to themselves. And uh, many economists these days in Germany complain that basically the market economy is increasingly being ideologically rejected, um, and that the state is sort of misunderstood or understood by many as sort of the economic leader who regulates everything uh, for everything. And this is a fundamental delegation of decision and social responsibility away from in, an individualistic uh, approach. Uh, some basically call this a sort of creeping spread of neo Um And another problem is, of course, and that not only relates to Germany, uh, we've seen in many policy fields, not the least uh, in the war in Ukraine, where um, you know, conspiracy theories take over people's minds, and that is called um, cognitive dissonance. What do I mean by that? We have high and good goals, uh, but it's questionable if and how they can be reached. And the solution of politics to this is we're taking small steps. We are morally doing the right thing. We're trying hard. And the solution is sort of a staging of an honest uh, effort uh, to show to the public. Um, and in that sense, you also have to view the all, always sort of strongly emotional and moralizing tone of this debate uh, in Germany, which, which basically all of the world is seeing <clears throat> that we are uh, basically putting it forward. And it sort of withdraws the entire debate from a professional and objective um, review. The people who are promoting it are basically labeling themselves as climate savers very often concealing successfully their private interests, and everybody agrees that we will continue with more of the same. And so the high societal costs and the inefficiencies are obscured, and the regressive distributional effects are accepted. It's sort of a hyper-ambitioned lack of ambition. There's another psychological moment unique to Germany. Failure is not foreseen in Germany, especially in politics. So um, this is a different stance to much of the rest of the world, especially American driven entrepreneurism that basically sort of um, has an idea in politics as well. But the idea in Germany is always more of the same until we completely fail. Um, <laughs> so we need more objectivity and reason in Germany uh, about the instruments of the climate policy that are urgently needed. Central elements of this must be effectiveness, cost efficiency, openness to technology, and of course, international division of labor, as well as competitiveness and social acceptance. Um, and in view of the effect, ineffectiveness and inefficiency of the German climate policy, we cannot continue to say, keep it up with the same instruments. Um, a fundamental strategy, strategy change, uh, to my belief, is necessary in the German climate debate, which can only be achieved with the introduction of a uniform CO2 price across all sectors. And only in this way can the productive forces of the market economy be used effectively and efficiently for climate protection. Um, we are seeing positive signs that this will happen already in the course of this year. We should finally end and stop promoting the uh, sort of sole expansion of renewable energies with high subsidies. And ultimately, the game, the aim of climate policy in Germany and for that matter, anywhere else in the world, must be to demonstrate that in the long term, we can have emissions reduction, uh, reductions combined combined with high and growing prosperity and a social acceptance. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, let's welcome our third speaker, Jacob.
Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, uh, it is my great pleasure to present today at Australian uh, National University our energy story of Poland in the context of the war in uh, Ukraine. Um, after the really extraordinary pandemic year of 2020, when the uh, energy prices and commodity prices fell to record lows, 2021 was very different. Economy accelerated. In Poland, we uh, noticed a significant increase in the production, and that resulted, resulted in burning more coal than before. <laughs> On top of that, the war in Ukraine really showed us how of an importance it is to run a smart policies and strategies for energy security. First, I'd like to share with you our current energy situation, very briefly show you where we are. Then I'll move to energy transition um, in Poland and our policies. Then I would like to show you the impact of Russian war and how much dependent we are on Russian resources. And at the end, as a summary, I would like to show and combine that and show how much of this energy transition is impacted um, by the war. For us now, the priority is to actually um, get this independence from Russian resources, gain full um, energy security with respect to uh, climate change and climate policies. So um, when it comes to our energy mix, coal plays the most significant role and it's been like that for many, many decades. Uh, we did significant changes in the last decade from 87% to 71%. However, we still have the highest indicator, one of the highest indicators in Europe for the, for the um, coal use in our energy mix. Um, when it comes to renewables, okay, we have had a significant, significant progress, uh, particularly in the solar, where we used to have 95% increase year by year. But if you look at the right bottom corner on the graph, photovoltaics play at this stage very, very small role of only 2%. And 55% of renewables is wind. And wind has been increasing only 5% year by year. This is very unfortunate, and this is uh, related to the in introduced policies uh, on the distance policies uh, between uh, wind turbines. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's not expected that the wind would grow as, as quick as, as solar, but there's a lot to do. And currently we are focusing on uh, um, utilizing uh, wind capacities offshore. Um, and one thing that we are not proud of, but this is a reality, we're also lagging behind among our European uh, colleagues, um, member states, in terms of uh, emissions. Uh, in fact, Poland is one of the top greenhouse emitters in the world. We did, we, 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 that is a significant change, 17% uh, less within a decade, but it's still, requires us to, to, to work more on that. And for this reason, we introduced a series of policies. We are also part of the European Union. And as a part of the EU, we are obliged to follow the EU policies to um, decrease uh, the emissions by 55% since the 90s by 2030, net zero by um, 2050s. But taking into consideration that we are the largest coal producer in Europe and our economy is very much based on coal, it's a big challenge for us. It's a hard thing 
but it's not impossible. For this, we introduced last year um, Poland's energy policy 2040 with the perspective 2050. And um, the policy, which is interesting, is currently being updated and amended because of the war in Ukraine. And I'll get to that in a moment. But just to give you the, 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 the few selected and important, some of the most important pillars of that, of that strategy is first of all, optimal use of own resources. We have those resources and we will be using them, but the coal consumption and coal share in the energy mix will be significantly decreasing. Um, by 2040, we um, intend to decrease the coal use uh, to 11%, maybe 20%, depending on the scenario, but we tend to be closer to 11, 11%. And I'm talking about thermal coal, coal of course, not the coking uh, coal. Expansion of um, electricity generation and grids, introducing smart grids and different solutions. Another important part, diversification of supply. And this is something that we have been working for over a decade now. And that also plays an important part now in um, relation to the war in Ukraine. But we've been working on developing um, gas supplies from the Nordic countries, um, oil from the Middle East. So it is crucial for us to strongly diversify this supply. Uh, development of energy markets, energy storage technologies, smart metering, uh, electromobility. Now we introduce many of those green zones in the center of, of cities where you're not allowed to get in with a combustion engine, alternative fuels or hydrogen technologies with the last year um, national hydrogen strategy uh, published. Another part, nuclear power. And this is uh, a decision that has been made and the discussion has been going on for decades in Poland. Till now, we don't have any nuclear power in Poland, but this is going to be changed. And um, in 2040, 25% of our energy is supposed to come from nuclear, nuclear power. Of course, development of uh, renewable energy sources will play a major role. As I mentioned before, we're lagging behind, but we're working strongly on increasing that share. This is actually interesting because the strategy from last year said that our renewable energy consumption in 2040 will be slightly less than 30% in our energy mix. This is, however, um, out of date with the current situation in Ukraine, and I'll get to that in a moment. Now this number is significantly uh, higher. A few other things, development of district heating and cogeneration as an important part, and improvement of energy efficiency, insulation, construction. I'll get to that in a moment. So now to show you the, the context of, of the war, showing our dependency on Russian resources, we used to be one of the most dependent countries in the EU on Russian resources. Um, depending on the, what data you tie into statistics, number two, number three, number five, but significantly dependent. If you look at coal, out of 63 uh, and a half million tons of internal consumption, 15% uh, of that used to come from Russia. Depending on the year, we're talking 10 to 50 million tons, and that's 10, 11 thermal and four, five coking coal. Um, gas um, imports from Russia is 55% above the average <coughs> in the EU. Um, an interesting fact much of that coal we would re export actually to Ukraine. 1.4 billion cubic meters. <laughs> um, we also have our own gas production. That's uh, 2.7 billion cubic meters uh, high methane gas that may be coming from mining and 3.7 um, billion cubic meters of nitrogen rich um, gas. 
and oil, another large dependency, we used to import 64% of our oil, of oil from, um, from Russia. So now to put this, uh, all those things, uh, the, the, the current situation, the transition policies and strategies, and the dependency into actions and what actually we have achieved or we're planning to achieve, um, I would like to show you um, in the context of that war, of war in Ukraine, how we believe the situation will be changing or is changing already. Well, again, on the left hand side, if we look at the fossil fuel, we look at coal, um, something that has been amended in the strategy now is that probably we're facing a temporary increase of uh, coal production. There's a massive deficiency um, of coal in Poland, particularly among private businesses who used to import coal from, from Russia. And that was a high um, calorific value and cheaper coal. So in order to secure our um, energy, we need to pr produce a little bit more. And this is temporary. And it's not a paradox. And we believe that even this temporary increase will actually accelerate the transition into renewables. Another point in coal is the redirection of supply chains. And Australia is one of the, and also putting the context of Australia into this, Australia will become one of our main partners. And that really keeps me busy, busy in the last uh, couple of months. But, um, uh, but yes, we, we have to offset 10 to 15 million tons from Russia. And Australia will play an important part together with South Africa and Colombia. Um, now, there's a, it's a little bit controversial, but there is a discussion on extending lifespan of our coal fire plants. So on the one hand, we see the necessity to, to, to secure our energy sources and energy generation. But on, this, on, the, on the other hand, we are aware that by, by investing in, in uh, coal fire plants, we're extending the lifespan and we produce uh, more greenhouses in a, in, a, in a longer term. So this hasn't been decided. We're still trying to figure out how to keep the balance. Um, yet the decision has been made that there'll be no new coal power plants. And this is something for sure. Um, and there will be no new coal, uh, coal, uh, coal power plants, not only because of climate policies, but also production of coal in Poland is becoming more and more expensive. When it comes to gas, uh, throughout our policies within a decade or more, we, um, uh, we strategized to, to get that independence from Russia. Although gas doesn't play such an important role as coal in our energy mix. We long time ago made that decision that we were not going to buy Russian gas. And anyways, and that, we knew that before, the, but before uh, Russia cut gas from, uh, from, from Poland, when we um, refused to pay in rubles, um, we knew anyways, that by the end of the year, we were going to uh, replace the gas from contract with uh, gas from Norway. Um, and for that, we've been building a pipeline from Norway via Denmark to Poland. Uh, and by the end of the year, hopefully by October, and this has been strongly accelerated by the situation in Ukraine, we should have the pipeline ready and be completely independent. At this stage, um, we use our own reserves and own resources, small production, but we're coping. Um, we also, and that's worth mentioning, um, um, decided to accelerate construction of new gas terminals and underground storage. Something worth mentioning, Poland has invested uh, large numbers of uh, 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 large, large funds in uh, um, LNG terminals. And Poland might play an important role in the Central Eastern region 
for the LNG uh, redistribution. Uh, now with new terminals uh, being built, that can even strengthen that that uh, that role. Um, last year we published the hydrogen strategy, and currently we are running projects on blending hydrogen with natural gas that should also increase um, the security here. Um, but we see gas as the source to stabilize um, our energy security um, between uh, renewables and coal until the nuclear power is available in Poland. When it comes to oil, also, we took steps to gain independence from Russia. And currently, there has been a series of in letters of intents and contracts signed by the Middle Eastern partners and uh, Saudi Arabian Aramco is getting to the Polish market. And that will already make a big shift from Russian oil to Middle Eastern oil. Now, getting to the, to the bright side, uh, of the energy mix uh, and renewables. Um, I mentioned initially that the war might cause the, the slowdown in decarbonization, um, but in the longer term, renewables will become the major uh, or the, the most strategic energy source for Poland and for Europe. Uh, the war made us aware that that we have to accelerate our transition, that this is the only, the only way. That's why this year, quite recently, our um, energy policy or energy strategy has been amended. It's still not published, but we already know that the new goal instead of 28% by 2040 is 50% of renewables in our energy mix. If we add to that 25% from nuclear, then of course, some gas, some um, some coal, and um, and cogeneration um, that should make us uh, reach the twenty fifty goals to eliminate coal by twenty forty uh, nine. Um, energy uh, nuclear power. I mentioned twenty five percent currently. That work has also been accelerated because of the war. There's been a discussion for decades, but there's currently the actual um, decisions. So the first power plant of one to 1.6 gigawatt capacity will be commissioned by 2033. On top of that, private businesses have been working uh, with uh, the US on uh, small modular reactors. And we are one of the few countries in the world actually uh, that have been so pro, uh, so uh, so ahead in uh, in developing technologies. Um, energy storage, well, role of batteries. Poland is becoming one of the major producers of uh, lithium-ion batteries in Europe. And here, there's another opportunity for Australia. We're also considering different options how to source the um, uh, uh, raw materials, lithium and rare earths and other other minerals and actually if you even from the perspective of our current dependency on China if you look at the situation with the uh, uh, railways and 70 railway um, routes from China to Poland or to Europe uh, most of them are dysfunctional now so we have to rely on sea freight so that also puts Australia on the map as the potential uh, supplier of those uh, minerals. Um, hydrogen also has been strongly discussed as a um, energy storage um, great potential. And last but not least, um, energy efficiency improvement. So we're creating policies uh, related to <laughs> construction to the construction sector, insulation, um, but also information and education. There's campaigns, and we all live in a, in a new reality. And it's important to, to make people aware that by saving, but that by decreasing one Celsius, one degree Celsius in the winter, 
they save, save significant amount of energy. So those kind of policies are also introduced and the, the education and information role um, will be very, very important. Uh, one more thing uh, I wanted to share, and um, it was great to, to listen to uh, Ambassador of Ukraine and uh, um, Ambassador of the EU about the, the situation and how we can also work together. So we see Poland as also a strategic partner for Ukraine. Now, currently, um, uh, the um, Australian government um, has sent a um, call to, to Ukraine, 75,000 tons, and this has to go through Poland. If we look at the future uh, about potential um, supplies for Poland, we are natural partner for Ukraine as well. Today, I learned maybe there's also potential to supply LNG. We have been buying LNG from, from the US. Maybe there's an option to, to do the same with Australia. And, and most likely Poland will be that partner for Ukraine to, 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 to transport the, 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 the resources through our, through our territory. Well, thank you very much. That's um, that was my pleasure. Uh, hi everyone, let me, uh, my name is uh, Llewellyn, as Mr. Smith, I'm an Associate Professor uh, at the Crawford School of Public Policy uh, here at the ANU. It's terrific uh, to be here today, it's terrific uh, to be able to uh, meet in person, and um, it's terrific to see such high uh, compliance and mask wear. Um, let me begin first uh, uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet and uh, also um, pay my respects to uh, the elders uh, present and uh, emerging. Let me also uh, begin by expressing my sympathies for the people of Ukraine. Um, obviously, uh, you know, it's just an extraordinary uh, difficult uh, situation in which they face and, um, you know, we all read their headlines. Um, so I'd like to bring in with a bit of an, a, a bit of an aside, uh, actually from the Asia uh, Pacific region. Uh, in 2010, uh, the uh, the uh, Japan uh, the Japanese government detected uh, a reduction in the imports that were available of rare earth elements. Now, as was just mentioned, rare earth elements are quite important. You don't use them in a large uh, large volumes, but products such as neodymium, for example, which is a base element, is used in the production of high quality magnets. Those magnets are used in electric vehicles. Those magnets are used in wind turbines. Um, and those uh, magnets are also used in uh, guidance systems associated uh, with, um, with missile defense, for example. Quite a broad range of uh, important uh, uh, uses. Now, it remains uh, unclear uh, about whether China uh, had placed a formal embargo on, uh, on exports of rare earth elements uh, to Japan at that time, but the reduction in imports did occur uh, at the same time that there was a lot of uh, geopolitical conflict between those two countries, particularly uh, the, the uh, Japanese government had arrested uh, a, um, a, a, the a captain of a fishing vessel which had rammed uh, a Japanese Coast Guard ship just around the Senkaku, the Senkaku Islands. It's important to note as well that at, at the time, and actually this continues to be the case uh, today, that China produced about 90% of the uh, world's rare earth elements compared to OPEC's market power in the oil sector, which stands somewhere historically between 40 and 50%, and it gives you an idea of how much market power um, lay with uh, China at the time. Now, the reason I, I, I mentioned that 
is because when I read over the, uh, the Repower EU plan, which was mentioned by Scott, a recent response uh, to uh, the uh, reliance of the EU on Russian fossil fuels, the strategies that were outlined in uh, the policies uh, in there um, were very familiar to, uh, to me, and they look very much like the toolkit that's available to governments in policy terms if you're thinking about dealing with this problem of asymmetric dependence, as you might call that, not mutual interdependence or mutual dependence, but rather asymmetric dependence. It's really a suite of policies which is designed to try and achieve three different things. The first of those is to use materials more efficiently. Okay? In, in this particular context, energy efficiency, we can think about things like you know, public call or government calls to reduce, uh, turn down thermostats. So you're using less gas and nevertheless providing the service you want, which is heating your, heating your homes. Uh, the second is to, um, to substitute for the uh, use of uh, the particular product in which you have this asymmetric dependency. And, you know, obviously in the case of gas, we're talking about electrification and given climate goals combined with uh, increased renewable electricity supply. And then thirdly, diversification. Okay, and so LNG terminals, as we just heard about, or in the case of rare earth elements for Japan, um, actually investing in Australia. And if you look at Linus Corporation's rare earth elements mining, which is about a thousand kilometers east of, um, of Perth, for example, uh, that's, um, uh, that's been funded by uh, a Japanese policy bank to try and reduce the market, uh, the, the, the dependence of, uh, of Japan on Chinese uh, rare earth elements. And you can see all those things going on here with diversification uh, and with energy efficiency and also with substitution through, uh, through um, uh, shifting in, uh, into, into renewable energy. But what was very interesting to look at in the, in the Japanese case uh, was that each of those responses operate on quite different timescales. That is the effectiveness of those policies operate on quite different timescales. Energy efficiency, for example, uh, can provide a response to reduce your asymmetric dependence in a matter of weeks or months. Okay? But if you're talking about things like substitution, you know, in capital intensive, intensive products, like we have a lot of in the energy sector, if you're talking about diversification that requires the building of LNG import terminals, some $7 billion in a number of years, that these are the kinds of things that can only work at longer timescales, medium to longer, longer term. That's very clearly what we saw in the case of Japan. The efficiency measures very effective in the short term, and uh, other kind of you know development of substitutes and so on have taken longer, but they've also proven to be effective in reducing that structural dependence uh, of, of Japan on, on China. Um, and so I've been asked uh, to talk a little bit about, uh, about offshore wind today, okay? And the point I really want to make is that offshore wind provides a tremendous opportunity for the EU uh, to diversify its fuel types, right? And promote uh, the, the uh, you know, help support clean electrification of the European uh, the EU, EU economy broadly, but also that it's something that's only going to work in the medium to long term. And that's because of the particular challenges that, that lie in the industry and building it out at scale, okay? So I just wanted to um, talk uh, about a couple of those things today. You can see that offshore wind is, uh, is mentioned um, in the Repower EU strategy as uh, something that, that the, the EU wants to push in order to manage this problem. Uh, dependency. You may have also seen recently uh, that actually national governments within the EU have started to get even more serious about offshore wind. Okay, um, and this is an announcement uh, just from a, a few days ago, actually, in which uh, Belgium, Denmark, Germany, and the Netherlands jointly announced that they 
are going to establish a new target for offshore wind of 65 gigawatts operated by 2030. Uh, and a combined total of 150 gigawatts by 2050, total global installed capacity to, uh, as of September the 21st was 35 gigawatts. So that's a really substantial commitment to increase the amount of capacity that you're looking at in, uh, in the offshore and offshore wind sector. Okay, so why do I think that offshore wind uh, is a real opportunity for uh, Europe as it thinks about decarbonization and as it thinks about getting off this asymmetric dependency on Europe, uh, on, on Russian, I should say, uh, fossil fuels? Uh, there are a couple of different reasons why that is the case. The first is because of the high capacity factors which are associated with offshore wind. This is data just from a couple of days ago. Uh, of the capacity factor, that's how much uh, electricity is being produced as a function of the total possible electricity that a given wind turbine can produce. Uh, and what you can see is that offshore wind has a quite a high capacity factor. That's the case relative to onshore wind. And it's also the case relative to photovoltaics. Okay. So for every dollar that you invest in the infrastructure, you're getting more electricity out of it as a function of its ability to produce, uh, you know, produce more with less, okay? Uh, the other thing that's really useful about offshore wind uh, is often the production of wind off electricity from wind offshore is not highly correlated with other renewable energy sources. And that means you, need, you can reduce storage costs that you might have a problem thinking about. We looked at this in some detail in Australia, for example, and offshore wind is not correlated at all with Australia's onshore wind and with solar. Okay, so that means when the wind's blowing onshore, you know, it doesn't really tell you a lot about whether the wind's blowing offshore, and that's also the case with solar. Okay, so if you put that together on a whole system basis, it means you're providing more stable electricity across the entire suite of renewable uh, renewable electricity, okay, compared to if you had a solar only system, for example. So high capacity factors, um, which, which is good for capital, uh, reducing capital expenditures, and also uh, a lot of the electricity is being produced at times when solar is not getting the job done for you, okay. The second reason uh, that I think that offshore wind um, will play an important role in Europe's long-term future is because of innovation. Okay. What you can see here from 2001 through to 2020 is the average size of wind farms, which is the y-axis on the, uh, the, uh, the, the left-hand side, uh, and the uh, rating of individual turbines, which you can see on the right-hand side, and that's that line for you there. And you can see that we're getting much, much better at building much, much bigger turbines. And that's also leading to much bigger uh, wind farms. Okay, and you can imagine how that reduces capital expenditures. You just need less steel, okay, for a given amount of uh, output of electricity. Uh, and, and also that uh, because of that, you're using less sea area to produce more as a function of the increase. In turbine size, this is a lot of innovation that's gone into that, right? Here's a look at what um, you know offshore wind turbines look like today. Fixed bottom offshore wind turbines. You can see they've grown a lot. For those of you who have been to London, you can see the London Eye over there on the on your left hand side, and you can see a 14 megawatt uh, wind turbine over here on the right hand side. If you're thinking about planning a port today rather than planning to be able to build 14 megawatt wind turbines, uh, most authorities are planning to, uh, for the capability to build 20 megawatt wind turbines. So for those of you who have been to Dubai, they're starting to get as big as that ginormous um, uh, skyscraper that you see over there. Really, really big. The reason why that matters um, is, is, is because it reduces your material costs and it reduces, you know, you need fewer turbines, less steel, uh, fewer nasals and components and so on. So if you're building these things, you've got less material costs going into it. Um, and also uh, it, it means that your operating costs are less. Fewer helicopters having to fly out uh, to, to, to maintain these, these facilities. 
So lots and lots of innovation, we expect that to continue over time. What that's meant in the EU is that prices have fallen really rapidly. And in some markets, offshore wind is competing today on a non-subsidized basis within the wholesale electricity market. Okay. So these are the strike prices from renewable electricity auctions in a number of different markets within Europe. And the key point really you can see is that there's been a rapid reduction in the strike price for offshore wind auctions across the EU, a reduction of around 75% um, over the last 10 years or so. And you know we expect that uh, to continue um, into, into the future. Okay, so um, so I think that you know in the long term, <laughs> as the EU repower uh, document suggests, offshore wind is an important part of the portfolio of energy types that's going to help Europe electrify and help Europe electrify cleanly. Okay, um, but as I said at the beginning, I think this is going to happen over a period of time. This is not something you get done next month. It's something that's going to lead to structural change over the period of a number of years, um, uh, rather like in the rare earth element case, developing new technologies that may just substitute away from the you know, So where does offshore wind stand today? I'll, I'll go through them quickly, but uh, it's quite similar to some of the graphs that we saw before. In some countries, offshore wind are already a pretty big deal. Look at Denmark. I was very happy to see uh, the Danish government uh, signing a, an MOU with the state of New South Wales a couple of weeks ago for um, jointly thinking about energy transition issues because we're about to build an offshore sector. Denmark's really, really good at it. So it's a terrific opportunity for us to learn from them here. Uh, Germany, um, de, uh, the UK, um, uh, if we keep the UK in, um, and the uh, and Netherlands and Belgium are already uh, producing quite a bit of offshore wind uh, within their total uh, electricity mix. Uh, in terms, uh, and that's, that's, that's in terms of electricity generated, right? This is, uh, this is showing you the gigawatts of new installations of wind power. And you can see that uh, offshore wind is running at about three to four gigawatts across the EU uh, per year, but that's going to scale up quite rapidly beginning in the latter half of this decade, 10 plus gigawatts in 2026 are planned or already passed by an investment decision. And I would expect that to increase over time. But nevertheless, you know, that's taking time. That's not a solution for you tomorrow if you want to start, um, you know, you want to start using Russian, uh, Russian, Russian gas, okay? Um, uh, now, just to finish, I just wanted to make a couple of points about why this takes time, okay? Why this is a structural solution rather than a short-term solution to this problem of fossil fuel dependency on Russia. And I'll mention a, a couple of different reasons. The first of those is just because of the need to scale. It takes quite a bit of time to build the productive capacity to be able to churn out 10 plus gigawatts of those enormous turbines per year, right? That's like, you know, you're kind of thinking about doing three a day or something like this, right? We've got, um, you know, expected uh, somewhere in the region of 900 turbines being produced a year, okay? Um, three a day, they're enormous. You need to have factories that are able to do that. And that means refitting, investments, so on and so forth. And it takes time to scale that up. Uh, this is data of Europe's wind uh, uh, supply chain map. Uh, for the offshore wind sector, you can see a lot of circles there. Those are different colors depending on which part of the supply chain. The size of the circle represents jobs, and the biggest circles are about 800 jobs, okay, for those larger ones. So you can see that it, uh, across Europe, there is a lot of economic benefits currently being produced from offshore wind manufacturing, but there's a lot of training that has to be done to be able to get this stuff to scale up. So in addition to just the productive capacity, you've also got training, you know, getting uh, retraining workers in the coal sector, maybe, or other sectors to be able um, to do, uh, to do this, this kind of thing. Okay, it's going to take time to get that up to scale. And then lastly, uh, you know, one of the challenges that Europe is going to face for electrification is needed to build the entire uh, electricity sector. The electricity sector is somewhere in the region of 
uh, 2,000 terawatt hours actually across the whole of the EU today. That's need, going to need to go up to about 6,000 terawatt hours in order to electrify 75% of all energy use that we need. Okay. So you're going to really, like Australia, you're really going to need to scale up the amount of electricity that you are producing uh, within, within the EU um, as a whole. Now, Europe's technical potential for offshore wind is about 25,000 terawatt hours. Okay. That's many, many, many multiples more than the current EU electricity system. But to unlock that, you have to develop floating offshore wind. Okay. Like we've got in the oil and gas sector, we've got to be able to have platforms further than 60 meters out, which are attached to cabling rather than drilled into the seabed floor. And that's pre-commercial today. We've got a few projects globally, but not a lot. It's going to take time and innovation, working through problems in order to be able to get that up to scale. Okay. So I think that uh, uh, just to conclude that offshore wind, you know, is a terrific uh, opportunity for, offshore, uh, for Europe. That's because of innovation. That's because of high capacity factors. That's because of all the great work that's been done in Europe as a lead economy in this technology. But there are a number of barriers that have become around floating, uh, around jobs and around <laughs> just scaling up in order to be able to meet that need. Very last point, you probably saw that in November last year, uh, the Australian federal government passed an Offshore Wind Infrastructure Act. It's one of the few areas where the former government and the current government really agreed that um, you know, we had uh, an area which was developed to respond to climate change in Australia. Offshore wind is a really fantastic potential opportunity for increasing EU and Australian collaboration. The EU is a global leader in this area. We've got a lot to learn from them about port infrastructure and how to develop that. Uh, there are a lot of companies that can invest in Australia from the EU. And I think it's really a terrific area for the new government to think about, if there are any political startups out there, um, to think about uh, in terms of promoting decarbonisation through increasing collaboration between Australia and Europe. Thanks for your time.